Good evening and welcome to the first lecture of 2018 of the Health Optimization Medicine Lecture Series for Continuing Medical Education. Um, I first started coming here nine years ago. I come here 30 days every quarter. And five years ago, I started the Health Optimization Medicine Lecture Series in order to improve and inform us on the advances on basic medical sciences, which have become very relevant in our clinical practice. Now, this is very important because um, whenever I stand on the podium, and whenever people see me outside, they still ask me, hey, Dr. Ted, what are you doing here, right? Now, my practice has been pioneering this in this country. It's a clinical framework to include health management in your disease management practice. Now, the body is composed of organs, like the heart, the brain, the lungs, the kidney, and so forth. And we do have tests for organ function. In fact, many of my patients who imbibe a little too many of the spirits actually can interpret the liver function tests for themselves. Now, underneath all of these organs, are specialized cells, for example, the hepatocytes for the liver, the neurons for the brain, um, and so forth. And uh, do we have clinical tests for specialized function? Sure we do. For example, if you wish to test for the indirect effect of insulin, then we test for the fasting blood glucose. But we forget that underneath all of these from the organ to the specialized cell. There's a basic or foundational cell made up of the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the plasmic reticulum, cell membrane, and so forth. It has not been possible before to actually detect what's going on inside these cells, and therefore medicine has evolved as such from organ-based systems to specialized cell systems. But now, can we have a tests for basic cell function? In other words, can we test clinically for basic cell functions common to all specialized cells of all our organs? And this is where health optimization medicine comes in. Yes, now we can through clinical metabolomics. And I know you guys hate me because many of you skated by biochemistry, but unfortunately, it is now upon us to review our biochemistry. Tonight in particular, we are interested in beta-hydroxybutyric acid. You could see here fats, carbohydrates, and proteins all come together into central molecule acetyl coenzyme A for um, burning into the citric acid cycle. Now, for example, um, if you want to test for the metabolites of carbohydrate, then you can now take a look at the anaerobic glycolysis, which is lactic acid, pyruvic acid, and of course, then the aerobic glycolysis, which is the Krebs cycle. We can now measure this instead of just memorize it from our textbooks. Now, a special interest tonight is the beta-hydroxybutyric acid, which we can measure also and will be touched on by our speaker. Now, cofactors are necessary to move the pathways forward. We know that carnitine is necessary to shuttle fats uh, through the mitochondria uh, for um, Carbohydrates and proteins, in order to enter the citric acid cycle, they need vitamins B1, B2, B3, and lipoic acid, for example. And this is the reason why we measure all of these metabolites to detect your deficiencies or toxicities in them. So we measure the cofactors and provide the recommended doses. Like, for example, in this patient, you have severe deficiencies in alpha-lipoic acid, B1, B2, and B9. Now, Clinical metabolomics paves the way for future healthcare strategies, and I, I chose metabolomics to be the primary um, module for health optimization medicine because DNA in genomics can tell us what can happen, RNA in transcriptomics can tell us what appears to be happening, proteins in proteomics can tell us what makes it happen, but it's only the metabolites of metabolomics that can show us what has happened and what is happening. So a metabolome refers to a complete set of small molecule metabolites, such as metabolic intermediates, hormones, and other signaling molecules, and secondary metabolites to be found within a biological sample. If you take a look at this, you see the farther you get away from genomics, the more you could see the effects of uh, 
the physiology and the environment on the individual. So what does our practice really look like? So when you take an FBS, uh, HbA1c, and fasting insulin, for example, if you're suspecting diabetes in your patient, you're actually detecting disease markers. And because you're actually looking at disease management, and this is a practice of illness medicine. Right? It's a clinical practice that diagnoses and treats disease, which is what we're trained in in allopathic medicine. But in reality, what's actually happening? Genes via nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and nucleic acids, symbionts, your endosymbionts inside your cells like your mitochondria, your exosymbionts like your gut or mi microbiota, your environment, the direct and indirect signals that are coming from your environment like the light and the sun, your, the circadian time and the evolutionary time all throw out metabolites, which can now be detected as metabolic biomarkers and we can now do health management instead of disease management. So we can, do, we can now detect early onset of metabolic deregulations, and this is what health optimization medicine is all about. The clinical practice is about the detection and correction of imbalances, and we do not diagnose and treat any diseases. So there is diagnostic metabolomics, and there is therapeutic metabolomics when you start giving the supplements to your uh, patients. And, and then if you want to manipulate the nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, the genetics, then you use the science of epigenetics. If you want to manipulate the mitochondria and gut microbiota, you use the sciences of epigenetics, bioenergetics, and the gut immune system. If you want to manipulate the environment, then you use the science of exposomics. And if you want to manipulate uh, the circadian rhythm and the evolutionary time, then you use the sciences of evolutionary medicine and chronobiology. So these are the seven pillars of health optimization medicine, metabolomics, epigenetics, bioenergetics, gut immune system, exposomics, evolutionary medicine, and chronobiology. This is what I call medicine 2.0. We still don't teach this in medical schools. Granted, we really have no time. So, illness medicine diagnoses and treats disease. Health optimization medicine or, and health optimization practice for non-doctors detects and corrects imbalances. Currently, the imbalances are corrected at the level of metabolome. For example, nutrients and hormones. Your children may get into the level of quantum physics. Now, since it's health optimization medicine, I always give this in all my lectures, let's have a very simple definition of health. Health equals A plus B plus C. Health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by A, the absence of disease, and B, the maintenance of balance between anabolism or processes that make things grow. For example, if you're trying to build your muscles, and catabolism, processes that destroy stuff. For example, your food has to be destroyed in order to create energy according to the cycle of life of an organism. So it's very simple. Take this away with you. Now, absence of disease is illness medicine, maintenance of the balance between anabolism and catabolism according to the cycle of life of the organism is health optimization medicine, meaning just because you're not, you're not sick does not mean that you're well. It only means that you're not sick. So fitness, I always have patients, so how's your husband? And the wife says, oh, my husband is fit. And actually, you know, that's not the answer that I'm looking for. Fitness is an optimal physiologic state that allows one to handle physical, emotional, and mental stress from baseline state according to the life cycle of an organism. Um, the easy way to remember this is this. You may be fit to, to run a marathon, but you're not healthy, and I may be healthy, but I'm not fit to run a marathon. So being physically, mentally, and emotionally fit asks the question, what are you fit for? Fit for what? So the clinical practice of health optimization medicine, the science, is measure the metabolite levels, especially of the nutrient and hormone networks. The art is to balance the hormone and nutrient networks using the active form of the nutrients and bioidentical hormones to the metabolite levels found at ages 21 to 30 years old. Optimal range, meaning home does not use the standard reference range for a given disease. Many of your patients come to me and said, my doctor said my thyroid hormone is normal. Well, I'm not looking for normal. Normal is a survival value. What I want is an optimal value. Now, 
I'm always asked whether or not my practice is actually evidence-based medicine. And if you have been hiding under a rock, you probably have not seen this landmark issue of the Journal of Evaluation in, in Clinical Practice in 2011, when they actually said that, you know, uh, evidence-based medicine is on the decline, and on the rise is evidence-informed individualized care. And of course, this is because we're able to personalize now the treatment for each patient. And the easy way to remember this is, I always say this here, is that if you have a patient asking for a rosary, believing that it's going to hasten his healing, do not ask, is this evidence-based? So. Dr. Ted's health wrench is actually a very simple uh, um, uh, diagram of what this is all about. So health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by A, the absence of disease, which is illness medicine, and allopathic medicine, which is Western medicine as we practice it today, alternative medicine, complementary medicine, in integrative medicine, and functional medicine with which health optimization medicine is often confused with, all of these actually diagnose and treat disease. And let's put that on the other side, just to, to create the wrench. And health optimization medicine is actually the detection of borderline deficiencies and subtle toxicities according to the life cycle of an organism. So that's health optimization medicine. So in illness medicine, we use quantitative statistics. In health optimization medicine, we use qualitative statistics. In illness medicine, you guys use evidence-based illness medicine. In health optimization medicine, we use evidence-informed individualized care. Now, the clinical practice of health optimization medicine can be summarized as follows. Illness medicine diagnoses and treats disease. Health optimization medicine detects and corrects imbalances. Illness medicine is after disease management. Health optimization medicine is after health management. Illness medicine is after lifespan. Health optimization medicine is after health span. Now, this is summarizes uh, everything that I do. Health optimization medicine, you can include this as a framework to do health management in addition to your disease management practice. So, there is at the center a concept called optimal wellness where your metabolite levels are at optimal levels and then borderline deficiencies and subtle toxicities can be detected by a clinical metabolomics laboratory and you balance this uh, by influencing the metabolites, genes, symbionts, environments and time and you have a health management plan. So what I like to, to, to hear professors say uh, in medical schools is that now that you have a disease management plan what is your actual health management plan? So remember, we are not diagnosing or treating any diseases with home. We are simply detecting subtle toxicities and borderline deficiencies in the metabolomic network, like that of nutrients and hormones, and balancing them to optimal levels. Now, a few years ago, I came to a conundrum because I was asking for a continuing medical education credits for a lecture that I gave on the mitochondria. And the professional body said, that is basic science, you're supposed to know that. Implying to me that there are no more advances to be made in basic science that's actually going to affect our clinical practice. So I started continuing basic medical education to address that. Now, continuing basic medical education is a refresher of basic medical information that we have probably forgotten that forms the basis of our clinical practice. Tonight, we are talking about ketones, ketone bodies, and ketogenesis. And so we take a look at this slide. You have to bear with me because I am doing the heavy lifting for Dom, who will be giving you a more advanced lecture than this one. All right, we start with lipolysis, and then which gives us fatty acids, and then with what's coenzyme A again? It's vitamin B what? B? Ah, five, right? So it becomes acyl coenzyme A. And then it undergoes beta oxidation to yield the central molecule of acetyl coenzyme A. Since many of you guys, when, when my patient presents uh, the supplementation of my patients to you, you are actually remove those supplements saying they're not necessary and they have been measured. I'm going to punish you by not discussing beta oxidation because I assume you know my specialty. So from acetyl coenzyme A, 
as, uh, with the proper signal like low insulin levels, high epinephrine, and high glucagon starts the process of ketogenesis. And it's mediated by four enzymes to yield the two uh, fundamental ones are 3-hydroxybutyrate uh, and acetoacetate, which can then be used by extrahepatic tissues and organs as a fuel in a process called ketolysis. And uh, ketolysis is actually a three enzymatic steps, again, to yield the central molecule of acetyl coenzyme A, which can then go into uh, the citric acid cycle. Now, I have a question here. I, I know that there are di diabetologists here. You know, um, uh, why does uh, 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 ketogenesis happen in diabetics uh, faster than, uh, than in, in insulin-dependent diabetes? Anyone? I can answer this. What, what is depleted in, gluconeogen in the massive glu gluconeogenesis and insulin resistance what metabolite of the citric acid ac cycles actually depleted? Uh, uh, that's why you're actually developing severe uh, ketoacidosis. It's, hey, you guys remove all my supplements. You should know this. It's oxaloacetate, right? So in the, um, the ketogenesis and ketolysis occur inside the mitochondrion. And as you can see here, there's acetone, acetoacetate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate as the three uh, ketone bodies. Now, this is, this, since this is our fifth year doing this, I'm actually happy to note, because the first time that I did a lecture here, some doctors assumed that there was only my, one mitochondrion per cell. So we have made big strides. And this is an aside. Uh, you see that the acetyl coenzyme a here can go out to the uh, acetyl coenzyme A can actually go out to, to the cytoplasm and actually can uh, be acted upon by HMG coenzyme A reductase to form cholesterol. So the cardiologists here would know that this is the enzyme that's actually being inhibited, but by all of the statins that you give to your patients. And just as a very aside aside, because this is a basic lecture then you should remember that your cholesterol is the father of all of your steroid hormones. It's like progesterone, aldosterone, cortisol, testosterone, estradiol, and you shouldn't wonder why you, should, you are now giving Viagra to your male patients on statins, or your postmenopause, your menopausing woman is actually experiencing severe symptoms of menopause. Now, that aside, here's the synthesis and utilization of ketone bodies. Uh, uh, they are actually made in the liver mitochondria, and um, acetone is uh, formed by spontaneous decarboxylation of acetoacetate, and they are used in all tissues except the liver because the liver doesn't have the enzyme to utilize the ketone bodies. So continuing after that refresher, I hope you got that all. Um, CBME is an update of basic medical information from when we graduated from medical school. Now, we still teach this stuff, and I don't know why. In the brain, the glucose is virtually the sole fuel of the, for the human brain, except during prolonged starvation. What the hell is this that we still teach them? You know, lactate is a preferred fuel for human brain metabolism, and that's why uh, the brain beta-hydroxybutyrate and lactate levels increase in fasting-induced ketosis, and that ketosis proportionately spares glucose utilization in the brain. Now. CBME is an upgrade of basic medical information from when we graduated from medical school. And we know that the ketogenic diet was actually created in the 1920s to treat intractable epilepsy. And we have actually codified and quantified that. And we still, until 2017, are actually using it. But what other pieces of information can be taught? Ketone bodies are actually used in therapy of Alzheimer's disease. And more recently, it's used in acute brain injury, whether or not it's traumatic or from strokes, as alternative brain fuel and as a brain protective uh, molecule. Now, CBME also provides new teaching of basic medical information that was never taught to us in medical school. The following is a video and shows us how far behind we have come. First of all, we have this oncogenic paradox, which has pu puzzled everyone from the beginning, the, the, the great minds and the thinkers. How is it possible that we can have so many provocative agents in the environment that we know cause cancer, cause the disease through a common mechanism? 
all right? So, for example, I mean, we, we have um, carcinogens, you know, we have radiation, hypoxia, inflammation, rare inherited mutations. People think cancer must be a genetic disease because I, got, I inherited a gene from my mother or my father and it gave me cancer. That gene product targets this, this little organelle, the mitochondria, and makes it inefficient. So that is a, the primary cause of the damage to this organelle. All of these different provocative agents will do that. Viruses, people know hepatitis C, papillomaviruses, they cause cancer. They cause cancer because they disrupt the energy metabolism in that organelle. And age, we get older. Older people are more prone to cancer than younger people because that organelle gets damaged with age. Now, what happens is when that organelle is damaged, it produces these reactive oxygen species, these are toxic byproducts of energy metabolism. And these ROS are both carcinogenic and mutagenic. They will damage the DNA in the nucleus, and they will further damage the energy metabolism in the, in the mitochondria. So these little ROS are produced from this plethora of disparate... Some people say, well, I don't know how I got cancer. I did this, I did that. I was, you know, it could be from any one of these things damaging that producing these ROS, the ROS then damaged the DNA and the new, so all the mutations and broken death chromosomes and all these things that we see and that we're studying and we're spending billions of dollars on are downstream epiphenomena of the damage to the respiration. And because of that, then we can see this. Well, anyway, we, 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 we designed a, a, a protocol. Now, we first have to characterize, yes, she has GBM patholo pathological report. Now, here's the big tumor um, in the brain. It's a multicentric glioblastoma. These are the worst of the worst kind. I mean, these tumors are really nasty. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we got this. And then as soon as she came out of surgery, uh, we, uh, she went on a ketogenic diet, calorie-restricted, therapeutic fast, water only, all this kind of stuff. We were able to bring her blood sugars down, her ketones up a little bit. And then we had an MRI several months after all this. Now, she was getting radiation, and she was getting chemo. So not, not, ke not timazolamide. She was off the steroids. She was getting radiation. But we have here a tumor several uh, months later, and we call this radiological resolution. You don't see any tumor in her brain anymore. And everybody was like shocked. Not that it doesn't happen. It happens very, very rarely. And maybe, maybe she's one of those rare cases. But we had several more like this over periods of months, and it looked like everything was good. So she, she was swimming in the Mediterranean. She felt good. Her quality of life was excellent. She gets off the diet, and then about two or three months later, the, the tumor comes back, and rather than going back on the metabolic therapy, she decides to go on Avastin, which is a big blockbuster drug in the pharmaceutical companies. I said, don't use that. I, I've looked into Avastin. It's the worst of the worst drug. Never use it. The, the FDA pulled it off the market for breast cancer, but they haven't pulled it off for, for brain. Uh, the, the, the tumor came back and she died. And this is why we have CBME. So CBME is a refresher, an update, an upgrade, and a new teaching of basic medical information that is never taught to us in medical school. Now, the next section is about dispelling myths about the ketogenic diet and nutritional ketosis. Now, the ketogenic diet was originally devised for illness or disease. Now, the first one was in the 1920s for epilepsy, and then with the invention of anticonvulsive drugs, it fell out of favor until the 1990s when the son of a famous director actually uh, uh, had intractable epilepsy that could not be uh, treated with uh, anticonvulsants and was placed on a ketogenic diet. And then we have the whole Charlie Foundation and then inciting uh, a whole uh, re reigniting an interest in the ketogenic diets for the treatment uh, as a treatment regimen of disease. Now it's being used for it's Alzheimer's, it's being ex uh, examined for Parkinson's, for various cancers, has just been elucidated in acute brain, brain injury and other chronic degenerative and inflammatory diseases. In this, you follow the strict ketogenic diet protocols, or the, the, for example, the classic four is to one protocols for epilepsy, the press pulse for cancer, which uh, our guest speaker will actually touch on tonight. Now, this is different from nutritional ketosis for sports performance, which shortly followed. And I have personally um, uh, managed cases of uh, metastatic uh, cancer successfully with a ketogenic diet. I have successfully used nutritional ketosis for fat loss for pre-competition bodybuilders because they need to lose fat. And, if, and the most important lesson that we've learned from marathoners and triathletes are as actually keto adaptation, meaning how quickly can you shift from one fuel to the other? So when you have a marathoner, you can actually get the, patient, the, the, the client 
to be rapidly keto adapted, meaning can shift very quickly from glucose to ketones. So you carve up the, the client so he can run out of the gate um, for, uh, to, to get out, burst out of the pack. During the long run, he shifts to um, uh, ketone uh, fuel, and then he could actually swig sugary drinks within um, a few hundred meters of the finish line and start sprinting again using glucose as fuel. And that is very rapid keto adaptation. For this, there are protocols such as a standard ketogenic diet, the cyclic ketogenic diet, and the targeted ketogenic diet for which illness medicine people actually know nothing about and should not say anything about. Now, nutritional ketosis for everyday health, we use this for reduced inflammation, fat loss, keto adaptation. For this, we take advantage of the natural ketosis upon waking up during the overnight fast that occurs during nightly sleep. See, when you sleep, um, you have about 100 grams of glycogen in your liver. When you wake up, you have about 20 grams, and your body actually starts shifting a little bit of its fuel source to your fats, and that's called nutritional ketosis. And, you know, the nice thing would be to extend that ketosis a little bit more by having a reduced feeding window or a time-restricted diet. Say, instead of taking your first meal as breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning, then you can probably skip your breakfast and just have your first meal at lunch. Now, intermittent fasting can also induce nutritional ketosis. Intermittent reduced calorie diet, um, like for example, the more popular uh, five to two fasting, I'm sure you've read that in magazines. And of course, a fasting mimicking diet like the Prolon, which is uh, a product that allows you to have a reduced calorie intake for five days uh, in a month and actually has uh, benefits similar to nutritional ketosis, like reduced inflammation, fat loss and keto adaptation. Now, the reason, the, the, the first column here, the ketogenic diet uh, for illness or disease is actually what we are used to in illness medicine. The other nutritional ketosis for performance and everyday health is modified, um, uh, ke the modified nutritional uh, ketogenic diet. So this got me very angry when I got it because it's the an official position of a professional organization in the Philippines showing exactly what I don't like to be shown in public because this is total misinformation. For example, it says that it tricks your body into thinking that it is, it is fa fa fasting causing your body to catabolize fat to raise your blood glucose. How the hell does catabolizing fat raise blood glucose? All right. The other one is a high-protein ketogenic diet, if not properly used, can be taxing to the kidney and eventually cause damage. What the hell is a high-protein ketogenic diet? It's a high-fat diet. And, and your, your, ketogenic, your, your uh, proteins, are 58% of them are gluconeogenic. And depending on your fasting state, you will convert most of your, your uh, gluconeogenic amino acids into glucose for fuel. So I know that uh, there are many leaders here, and you're preparing your statements for your various societies and your official positions on the ketogenic diet. So here it is. Please just stick to the fact that we cannot recommend, uh, we, we are not in a position to recommend it for nutritional ketosis, for performance or everyday health, but we are in a position to recommend it for illness or disease. And it's a kind of um, uh, misinformation uh, that can be corrected very rapidly because we do, not, we do as illness medicine doctors, have the expertise for disease. For example, if your patient has diabetes, and wants to go in a, into a ketogenic diet and has heart disease at the same time, yes, that impacts your specialty. But if someone wants to go into nutritional ketosis for performance or everyday health, please, it's outside of our domain of expertise as illness medicine doctors. Now, I'm usually asked what do I do, uh, what do I recommend for my clients who want to do this. This is an older uh, journal, uh, 2009. It's a mini fast with exercise protocol for fat loss. And um, essentially, I recommend an eight hour feeding window. I recommend that, you know, uh, noon to eight, you finish eating at eight. And then uh, in the morning, as I said, you have about 20 grams of, uh, of glycogen left, that's glucose. So why don't you do a brisk walk for 40 minutes, which is uh, the exercise. Brisk walk is you're able to still talk, but you have to catch your breath. That will 
remove um, most of the, the, all of the 20 grams of uh, your glucose and then kicks your body more into a nutritional ketosis mode. Now, when you wake up, chances are you probably have about uh, 0.5 to 1.5 millimolar of nutritional, ket of nutritional ketosis as a normal mechanism of the body, and you probably would like to get into an optimal zone anywhere from 1.5 to 3. And ketoacidosis occurs at around over 10 millimolar. So what do I recommend for those who are actually wanting to, to investigate any diet, not just the ketogenic diet? First, optimize your nutrients, micronutrients, and gut health. Any diet you decide to follow will incur vitamin, mineral, and cofactor deficits. Get tested for macro and micronutrient levels and gut health, including your gut microbiota. And as our guest speaker will allude to later, the gut microbiota will actually affect your results. Correct deficiencies or toxicities and poor gut health before starting any diet. And then target your macronutrients according to your activity. If you are going to be doing a lot of aerobics, then target your meal to be a carbogenic meal. If you're going to be doing a lot of weightlifting and resistance, then make your meal a proteogenic meal. But if you're going to be sitting on your office the whole day without exercising, probably you would like a ketogenic, some ketogenic meals, but on a reduced calorie count. All right, it's time to introduce our guest speaker. The topic is uh, Emerging Applications for Nutritional Ketosis. Um, tonight's speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Dominic D'Agostino. He's from the Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology at the Marsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida. A few of us here have had the chance to hear him lecture on a smaller group um, uh, last, uh, December, last November. Um, in San Francisco. Um, you might not recognize them, they're mostly here. Um, he is actually um, a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences and Nutritional Sciences out of Rutgers in New Jersey. And he has a PhD in Neuroscience and Physiology at the Division of Pulmonary uh, and Critical Care at the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at Rutgers also. Then his doctoral dissertation was heme oxygenase is necessary for hypoxic chemosensitivity of cultured rostral ventrolateral medulla neurons. Now his present positions, uh, he's a tenured associate professor uh, at the Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology Department at the Marsali College of Medicine in University of South Florida. And uh, from 2014, he's been a research scientist at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition or IHMC. Um, his research interests are as follows. He develops and tests metabolic therapies, including calorie-restricted diets, ketogenic diets, exogenous ketogenic agents, and metabolic-based drugs that target pathways linked pathophysiologically with seizure disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, metabolic dysregulation, cancer, muscle wasting, and exercise performance. Second prong of his research interest is his um, his past and current projects have identified cellular and molecular correlates of CNS toxici oxygen toxicity, or CNSOT, seizures, a phenomenon which limits the capability of the special operations diving. The reason why he and his wife has the one, have this wonderful caller tonight is that they've been to Anilao diving. Focus is specifically on measuring neuronal excitability, react reactive oxygen species production, biomarkers of oxidative stress, and global blood and tissue metabolomics. The third area of research is to develop and test strategies that exploit the metabolic defects of cancer by targeting cancer-specific glycolytic mechanism, like the Warburg effect, develop press pulse protocols, and enhance the efficacy of existing cancer therapies. Independent of energy metabolism, the ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate is an inhibitor of the nod-like receptor family of pyrene domaining protein, the NLRP3, in case you didn't attend this lecture that I gave three years ago, then you should brush up on it tonight. Now, an emerging area of interest is the developing um, metabolic-based therapies that improve health biomarkers linked to obesity, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, wound healing, and exercise performance and resilience. In vitro and in vivo studies continue to validate the efficacy, mechanism, and action and safety of metabolic therapies via diet, supplements, and drugs, including exogenous ketones with pharmacokinetic and toxicology studies. 
Data has produced remarkable results in animal models, and current efforts have focused on moving these therapies into human clinical trials with, whom he is, with which he is involved now. Now, the six latest peer-reviewed publications, this guy is a prolific um, uh, researcher, and as you can see, as in tw February 2018, he has, uh, from November, he has uh, already another paper, the anxiolytic effect of exogenous ketone supplementation is abolished by adenosine A1 receptor inhibition. And then um, he, he also uh, co-wrote the targeting the Warburg effect implications in the management of glioma. He uh, co-wrote uh, the one-week and eight-month effects of a ketogenic diet or ketone salt supplementation in multi-organ markers of oxidative stress and mitochondrial function. Um, adenosine A1 receptor antagonism abolished the anti-seizure effects of exogenous ketone supplementation. Uh, complex 1 inhibition augments dichloroacetate toxicity, cytotoxicity through enhancing oxidative stress in glioblastoma and the need for revised review of article in ketogenic di dietary regimes for cancer. And then he has also his latest book chapters, The Ketogenic Diet and Ket Ketogenic Supplementation for the Central Nervous System Oxygen Toxicity, Hyperbaric Medicine Practice. Uh, the second one is Tripping Over the Truth, how, metabolic, how the Metabolic Theory of Cancer is Overturning One of Medicine's Most Entrenched Paradigms. That was the video that you saw. And then uh, reduction of sporadic malignancies by stimulation of cellular repair systems by targeting cellular energy metabolism. Now, if any one of you have Googled our um, guest speaker for tonight, perhaps you have seen this picture of it. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Dr. Dom D'Agostino.